not necessarily responsible for the education that's supposed to foster a decent, clean, livable community to enhance the educational system. That's not necessarily their mandate and what they're funded to do. Uh, but in terms of the schools who would have that responsibility, they did as best that they could based upon the circumstances that many of the kids brought to school on a daily basis. Uh, you know, many kids brought, you know, the, the issues of their home, the issues of the community into a school setting, and that can have a tremendous impact on the learning experience. You know, so as much as you may want to, you know, cast blame here, there on the achievement level of students, when you have students come to school that don't have the fundamentals put in place in terms of moms, dads, you know, clean home, being fed, you know, the very basic rudimentary things that allow a young mind to develop into a, you know, a more mature mind, you can't expect a school teacher within a five hour day, more than a 20 hour week to absolve the social issues that, you know, many kids uh, in Chicago public schools that may come from Chicago uh, housing developments or from a very dense urban environment bring to a school environment every day. And what's the you from the, that type of environment? Well, just the intent. I mean, I was able to, I grew up a block away from the project, so I didn't necessarily grow up in them on a day-to-day -day basis, but I, was, I had access to them. And just that block difference in my grandparents, uh, basically we were able to instill the values in me to be able to have an objective point of view of what I was looking at on a daily basis, and that, and that allowed me not to succumb to the environmental, you know, predispositions that can you know harm many young people to come from that type of environment. Okay. And with your success of the book and where you're at now, do you feel that the audio project helped you? You know. It, it did. It did. I would be, would be no mistake about it that it did. But you know, I try to let people know that it wasn't. You know, I had a very strong will to succeed, and you know, the documentaries were the first thing to forty to me that allowed me to be able to do that, and they were able to be utilized to a great extent. I mean. You know, we did the documentaries. I'm 30 years old now, so we did that over 17 years ago. Okay. And um, back to the housing, I believe home that many Chicago housing projects. They've been torn down now. Do you think that has affected uh, the children? I think it has. I think when you look at the communities, if you were able to leave out here today, I mean, we're at the South Side, Northeastern Jacob Carruthers Center for the City Studies. I grew up right down here. I mean, this is where I hung out. I mean, I spent a lot of my time, you know, coming in here doing homework or looking at TV or, you know, you know, trying to jip the vending machine or something. Yeah, whatever, you know, but I spent a lot of time here. And if you go outside, you'll see parks, you'll see uh, a cleaner environment, and an environment is more conducive to develop a more balanced young person to be able to have the academic achievement and pursuits that I think we all, you know, make the investment for in, in education. See, um, do you think that the demolition solved any of the issues? It, it, it took away the environmental, the, the, just the superficial things in terms of people being able to look at their community and having a sense of pride about where they live. You know, you can see that people, you know, they take pride in where they live, you can do a bunch of different things. And so, when people have pride in their, their primary residence, in their home, and they have a community feeling, that transcends into the lives of a child. So, you know, they, they've done a good job of that. The question is that over the long term, will that be able to be sustained? Because the, you know, the original uh, high-rise, you know, project builders that were built in the in the 60s, they were initially, you know, as pr productive and, as, and had all the things that I just mentioned. However, over time, they deteriorated when you had a lack of social, when the socioeconomics were not able to be balanced with those people that live within those environments. And so when the jobs disappeared, when you know you didn't have fathers at homes, that deterioration is what brought about the you know, the calamity that we talked about in our America. And uh, what policies have been put forth that you believe have improved the lives of the people that you work in? I think in terms of looking, I don't know if I can really point to any specific policy. I mean, you can look at the fact that uh, you know that people have to you know uh, be trying to find work. Uh, that you know, people should be drug free. Uh, the criteria that they have in terms of the monitoring, uh, you know, for people within CHA. But you know, we're living in we have, we're in an economy right now that's you know teetering on 10 percent, uh, and probably is double digits in black and brown communities. So to to impress upon people to you know to try to find jobs, some people will, but most people won't. I think that there has to be within this time to make sure that there's an incentive 
And I don't think that policy has been in place making sure that the incentive is there to be as, uh, as, 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 as strong a parent as you can be within your home. To try to make your home as conducive as possible to nurturing that young mind so therefore it does not have, uh, as it develops into a more mature mind, that it does not have the proclivity to be involved in criminal illicit behavior. Okay, and I did a little research on Bonhue as a charter school. It's, a, it's, a, it's not only a charter school, it's a University of Chicago charter right, school. Right, UIC, I've seen that. Mm -hmm. Now, has that done better? I think it's done tremendously. I mean, I don't think they're full yet in terms of, of they have all eight grades yet, but I think they are up almost to maybe the fifth or sixth grade. It's a, uh, it's a lottery school, and it's a competitive process to get in there. The people who live within the community get first dibs there, and, it, and, it, and it's great. I mean, the kids are learning. Kids are coming here that are coming from mixed incomes. Uh, and so that, that, that type of integration of, of, of social economics, even though there may be a kid that it comes from a single mom, you know, they may, you know, that, that kid may have me in a classroom that comes from a two parent home. And with that type of, uh, a type of environment, that child won't, I don't see that child having any less because, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. And I think the University of Chicago Donnie Charter School is a great village. And did your teachers Help you along the way. Oh, my teachers were tremendous. I don't think my teachers allowed me to do one thing. That's to, to be able to talk and communicate to the, you know, the level that I have. And without that, and with them, with them fostering that and enhancing that and challenging that and honing that is what's got me to be able to, you know, to develop into the young man I am today. And this is a side question. Is Miss Tolson still? No, Miss Tolson, I think, is retired now. Oh, I see. Okay. And, um, now, 2009, you're running for the U.S. State Senate. No, you know, United States Senate. The United States Senate, excuse me. Um, what, what do you feel, like, what policies are you going to pursue or speak upon regards to education? A lot of the things are going to be regarding education in terms of really providing incentives to foster family. I think that as much as we want to talk about what we can do from a policy standpoint. Policy and government, schools, teachers, can't do what natural parents can do. And if we create the incentive for families to be together, then when people conceive children, that, is, that they have a greater notion than being a baby's daddy or a baby mom. And so if we can provide the incentive that when people come together and bring children in the world, that it's not just about you know the fact that you brought a child in the world, it's the fact that you brought a family together. And I think that the incentive needs to be there. And I think that you can find ways in, in, in policy to do that. Because if we can solve the, the educational issue, then we can solve a lot of other problems because there are probably eight or nine budgets that are dedicated from one failed, from one failed situation of a child in terms of, of uh, mental health, in terms of uh, incarceration, in terms of juvenile delinquency, in terms of uh, uh, foster parenting systems. If we can just solve the one problem of bringing children into the world with families, then we eliminate probably eight other uh, budgets that, that, that are dedicated to the failure from that derivative of the lack of family that occurs. And, you know, some people call it social engineering, but I believe it's just good old-fashioned values. And I think that we're at a point now that people want more than what they have. And I think they'd be willing to make the sacrifice if the discussion was put on the table that we are a government that wants to provide the incentive for people to become families. I believe that a child that does well in school should have an equity stake, you know, should create an equity stake within that household. A child's performance in school, a, a, a parent's performance in working with their child. Because I believe that the, that, that the gap between success and failure is not that wide. It's just the fact that we don't, it, it just takes so much to happen on a policy standpoint for people to be able to transcend a gap that isn't that wide. And they don't have the adeptness to really get people. Not necessarily the legislature, but to get people to understand what they have to do to sacrifice in order to get over that hump. And when you get people to move in that inertia, it's enough to transcend that small gap that I think will allow America to become the America that everybody expects it to be and the people around the world, you know, herald us to be. And I think that from a legislative standpoint as a United States Senator, that's really principally dedicated to absolving that issue, I can help solve that problem. I mean, you know, I'm right here, you know, I don't have a suit on in Taiwan, and I, you know, I can do that, but it's a matter of being comfortable. It's a matter of letting people know that you're not trying to speak at them, but more so speak with them, and you're willing to stand with them to get over that, you know, because that's what happened to me. I was raised by my grandparents. 
I was a ward of the court. My life could have gone totally different had I not been born in an environment uh, that my grandparents put me in.